Welcome to the Self-Reliant Living Show, where we talk all about a self-reliant lifestyle to save money, live greener, eat healthier, and be prepared for anything so you can take care of the ones you love in good times and bad. I'm your host, Jennifer Osuch, a homeschooling mom of three boys. I'm the author of the Preparedness Planner series, and my husband and I are the lead teachers of Self-Reliant School, a website dedicated to giving you the skills and confidence to take care of yourself and your community. Be sure to stop by and pick up your free videos from Inside Self-Reliant School that will get you started growing, cooking, and preserving your own food today. You can pick these up at selfrelianceschool.com slash free. Now, on with the show. Welcome to the Self-Reliant Living Show. And today we have a wonderful guest. Her name is Constance Smith, and she has um, been married for a long time. And she has three children that are grown now, but she homeschooled them. Her husband was in the military for 25 years. Oh my gosh. And she's lived everywhere from Alaska to Germany. So I'm definitely going to ask her about um, living overseas. That's very interesting. But now she homesteads in northern Alabama. And she has been a blogger for a really long time. So she has had this sort of um, extra a thing that she does on the side. We're going to ask her about that in terms of being an extra source of income for her. So welcome, Constance Smith. Connie, are you there? I'm here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? Very well. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. Okay, so let's just dive into this because you have such an interesting bio. Can you tell us a little bit about you and your family and then what your background is? Because I know you've lived all over the world, right? And what made you decide to settle down in Alabama and homestead? Oh my. Well, let's see. I grew up in the Midwest. Um, I'm originally from Wisconsin. That's where my family's from. Um, I joined the Army myself and met my husband at chapel service in basic training. And a few months later, a few months later we were married. <laughs> um, you know, on paper, it never should have worked, but you know, that was 25, almost 26 years ago. So it was meant to be. Um, I grew up in town. Uh, to me, I guess you would call it the city, but um, nowadays that would be a small town, I guess. But my grandmother lived in the country, and every time I went to her house, I just really felt like that's where I was supposed to be. And um, fast forward through the years, we um, lived all over the place, Virginia, Texas, um, Alaska, and Germany, of course. And, you know, our last duty station that we ended up with uh, in the Army was Redstone Arsenal in northern Alabama. And... We just kind of fell in love with the area and um, ended up retiring here for a number of reasons. Uh, one, the cost of living is really good here. Uh, you can get a lot more for your money as far as buying land and buying a home. And so that was a, a big factor for us. Um, additionally, the Redstone area, the Huntsville area, there's a lot of aviation businesses. And my husband was aviation in the Army. So looking at you know post-military life, uh, it was good for him as far as employment goes. And um, so we just kind of fell in love with the area. The weather is a little bit hotter than I would like it to be. Um, but, you know, you you get used to it eventually, or so I'm told. <laughs> um, I'm but, uh, to yeah, so we, <laughs> yes, I, they, I, they say you do, but I no, don't know. Not I'm really. doubting that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know our last our last station prior to coming here was Alaska, and um, I absolutely loved it up there. I, I cried when we left because it, it just it stole my heart. A different kind of living up there. Yeah, yeah, and what a dramatic change to go from Ala mm -hmm. Alaska to Alabama. Yeah, so we're in Texas, so we we get that heat. And I have been mm -hmm. here. I've been in Texas since I was just really a young young girl. Um, like mm -hmm. five years old, and no, you do not get used to me. <laughs> it's, it's still, it's one of those things, I guess you live with it, and then, but now that I'm getting older, I'm like, oh, it's a little hard on me. But um, this was a fairly recent move for you guys, so you're, you're kind of fresh in terms of the homesteading life. How did that, mm -hmm. um, how did that play out? I mean, what made you 
you know, think, okay, well, I'm, I'm just going to go and get this land and we're going to have all these animals. Mm -hmm. Was that something that you guys planned for a really long time? Or was it something that just, you know, you seize the opportunity? Well, my husband, um, he was an army brat, so he kind of lived all over the place. But one of the things that we talked about when we um, first met, I guess, was the kind of, you know, the someday dreams. And both of us down the road at some point wanted to live out in the country. And through all the years, we lived um, 19 different places. And there was one particular home that when we rented it, it was the first place that we rented that was out in the country. We had, at the time, 60 acres. We didn't even know it at the time. We were just renting a house that happened to have some land. But that was the first time where, as a military family, we were able to have chickens and we were able to garden. We could hunt in our own backyard. And it was, we felt at home. And so we knew that down the road when retirement time came, that that was, that was exactly what we were going to look for. Wow. Well, that's, so you had like a little preview there and you loved it. Mm -hmm. and so that's Absolutely. What okay, so what, what does your husband do now? Because he, he spent, what, 25 years in the military, so he mm -hmm. retired. And then mm -hmm. so now he has, he's, he helps you on the farm or he does something else? What does he do? <laughs> Actually, he has been an overseas contractor for the past year. And oh. so we actually closed on this house while he was overseas and everything that I have done so far here has been a one-woman show. <laughs> wow. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. um, that's a lot. And that's what an accomplishment, too, though. Yeah, um, you you okay. roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> roll with it. There you go. Okay, so you recently added some rabbits um, yes. to your homestead. So can you tell us a little bit about how you keep them? Because I know it's not just like in cages like a lot of people do it's mm -hmm. it's more natural than that um mm -hmm. but can you describe the sort of crate that you keep them in because i know that i've talked to a lot of people who have uh, rabbits and they you know I, i've asked them how they keep them and they try they've tried the sort of thing that you're doing although mm -hmm. I, I think that you've got got the answer to it with this question but they <laughs> say that they dig underneath but can you just mm -hmm. talk about the crate that you've got and what you're doing to prevent that? Sure. Um, well, a lot of people have heard of a chicken tractor. And I, when we had that farmhouse, I had built a chicken tractor for our chickens when they were young, before they were too big to really free range. And so basically, I built a rabbit tractor. So it has a yard attached to it. The entire thing is about three feet by six feet. It has a little house that's attached to it. And then they can go out into the yard where they can dig if they want to. They can eat grass and clover and all of that and kind of live a natural lifestyle. They still have, you know, their food and water dishes that any rabbit would have, but their feet are on the ground. And I just feel like if an animal is going to be on my homestead, I'm going to give it as good a life as I possibly can while it's here. Um, these are meat rabbits, so I, I have no, um, you know, emet, you know, I'm not misguided on, on that. There's, there's no, you know, attachment that they're a pet or not you know, because they're not. And um, so the what what I have done is on the bottom of the, the, the yard part itself where they have access to the ground, um, I took metal fencing and I created an apron. So the apron goes into the yard where the rabbits are and also comes out. And where I cut the, the fencing, there's kind of sharp points and it's almost like barbed wire. And so the, that cut edge is to the outside. So if I have a predator that comes along and tries to dig underneath it, they're going to poke themselves on those sharp wires and discourage them from trying to dig. We have a huge coyote population here. Um, I see them in broad daylight coming out and checking out my animals. And, you know, so far I've not had any issues at all. And I know they've been around. I've heard them right outside my bedroom window. Um, but nothing has been able to get to my rabbits. And I, I, my male, my buck rabbit really likes to dig holes. But he can't dig his way out because of that. And they're also only in one place for no more than like two days. So it would take them a while to dig all the way out. But they're going to be moved long before that ever happens. Yeah. And you have a video where you show... Um, how you set this up and we'll mm -hmm. put a link in the show notes because that's 
like I said, when I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, that's just so awesome because that sort of, like I said, solves that problem of, of the digging and all of that. Um, can you talk about your chickens? Because you, you have chickens too. And um, <laughs> um, did you have them? Well, you just said a little while ago that you had this sort of preview when you, you rented a house. Did mm-hmm. you have chickens in that, that house? How did you learn to care for them? Are you doing this all on the fly? Or, um, you know, how, how do you um, educate yourself, I guess? Or did you have that from when you were younger? Oh, no. Um, My only experience with chickens when I was little was when I was about one to two years old at my great grandmother's house. I remember she was a farmer. They had a full blown chicken farm and, you know, all of that. And I remember my great aunt taking me into the hen house and wanting me to gather the eggs from other under the hens. And being afraid to put my hands under there because I was afraid they would peck me. Um, and then I remember seeing a, a baby pool full of chicks and just being enamored by that. But, you know, that was forever ago. Um, as far as how I learned, well, that first set of chickens that we had at the farmhouse were gifted to me by a friend of mine. Uh, she had chickens and she had a younger group that wasn't uh, getting along with the older group, which is, you know, pretty typical for chickens. And so she asked me if I wanted the six younger ones. And so I was, I was happy to take them. And so she really mentored me and gave me a lot of excellent information, you know, ways to save money, things that the chickens did need or didn't need or not to waste my money on. And so she was, she was very, very, very helpful as far as that goes. And, you know, we lived there for a couple of years and then we ended up moving, um, uh, went to Alaska and so, of course, we couldn't take our chickens and everything with us. Um, I, I gave them to someone who was just starting out and, and, and it's kind of getting started with keeping animals and everything. So um, I know that they were going to be taken care of. Um, and then I kind of had it because it had been so long since we'd had the chickens. I kind of had to relearn everything again because when you're not actively doing things, you kind of forget the ins and outs of it. <laughs> and so I, I have I, I'm a book fanatic. I love to collect books and it's very hard to get rid of books once they come into the house. (laughs) But I have a lot of um, country living, homesteading type of books, self-reliant books. And I I glean the information because, you know, they'll sometimes have contradicting viewpoints because it's always someone's opinion. And so I just look at the different viewpoints and glean from that what I think would be right for what we're doing and what we want. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, Stuart's asking if, um, you know, because your husband is away, then your children, uh, because they're grown children, right? They live close Mm -hmm. and they can help. Do they come and and help on the homestead or is that something that they don't, they don't do? Do they have the same sort of values in terms of the land and the animals and all of that? They do. But my older, my oldest child is my daughter, Jennifer, and she actually lives in North Carolina. (laughs) Um, and then my older son, Joshua, he's in the army himself. He's a helicopter mechanic, just like my husband was. And my father-in-law was, and he's actually stationed in Germany with his wife. And so my youngest is still here, but he is about to join the army himself. So when there's things that I need him to help me with, you know, if there's something that it really takes two people to do, of course he'll help me. And, um, but they, I think that they have always had an appreciation for, um, this kind of living. We, they were, they lived in that house, that farmhouse for several years, you know, and I could see that they blossomed there, that, that they were very happy there too. And, you know, my daughter lives out in the country. My older son, he hasn't seen this place yet, but he cannot wait to come here. Um, and then my youngest, you never know. He's got his own mind, so we'll just have to see what happens there. <laughs> Although he that. is definitely not a city city boy. He's yeah. definitely not. So. Yeah. Well, Amy is saying that she loves books, too, and she can never get rid of hers either. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have all of the homesteading stuff, but you also – um, our photographer, and mm-hmm. you have um, some different uh, cameras set up around your property. And um, you know, you were just telling us about the what the coyotes that you said you could hear <laughs> from your bedroom and all of this. Yeah, but you've, you've you have what trail cameras 
-hmm. and you've seen wildlife, deer, wild boars. Tell us Mm -hmm. about that. And does that, um, you know, do you guys hunt those? Uh, You know, do they come too close? What's life like with Mm -hmm. all of that wildlife around you? Um, Well, the trail cams I set out shortly after we moved here because I wanted to be able to see what kind of wildlife was coming around. Um, I, you know, I wanted to know what was out there. I wanted to get an idea of what kind of hunting might be available to us. Um, the boars, by the time I realized that we had them, um, hunting season for boars here in Alabama is pretty much year round, but there's certain times a year you can hunt 24 hours a day for them. And these boars had only been coming around at night. And unfortunately, I didn't see them until you could only hunt them during the day. And I honestly have not seen any sign of them since then. So I'm hoping they come back around later this summer and uh, we can put them in the freezer. Um, But yeah, so I've used the trail cams for a number of reasons, not only to see what kind of animals are out there, but also to get an idea of any kind of two-legged uh trespassers that might come around i had a couple issues when we first moved in and i went out there and barbed wire my my uh property line and i haven't had any issues since um so i do that and that that's really what the trail cams are for um and then as far as photography goes that's just something that kind of grew with blogging um You know, when I first started out, I didn't really take pictures because I didn't have the ability. My first my first home page was done with a web TV. So that wasn't even a possibility back then. And we the digital cameras weren't even a thing when I started. So we've come a long way. Yeah. Um, But yeah. So photography is something that I've kind of learned, um, taught myself to do over the years. And um, I think I've gotten pretty good at it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Two legged. um trespassers because you don't usually think about that when you're mm-hmm. when you're looking at the different wildlife that's on your property yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um okay so along these lines with the photography and um animals you volunteer mm-hmm. at your animal shelter and can you tell us you know why you do that and um what it's like because i know you've gotten a puppy recently you've added added puppy to um your herd I guess your pack. and <laughs> yeah. tell us tell us about that and um what you do for them because it's related to blogging mm-hmm. right uh, well I've always done a lot of volunteer work over the years and in the past it's generally been through my military community um I was an FRG leader um care team you know just different things that them they needed for me or they needed me to do and Um, I enjoyed giving my time back that way and using any skills that I have that could be of benefit to other people. Um, When one of the fun volunteer things that we did was in Alaska, my kids and I, and we kind of incorporated this into our homeschooling, we did a fish study where we would set up fish traps and then we would monitor what kind of fish were coming through the river and we worked with the the Fish and Wildlife Service with that. Um, But now being here, um, Redstone Arsenal is a military installation of sorts but it's really more of a research installation where you've got nasa and all that stuff so it's not really an army post um so it's a completely different lifestyle there wasn't like a real unit for us to plug into or anything like that and i still wanted to be able to have um, the chance to give back to my community and to help out um, where i'm needed and one day i saw a post on facebook where the local animal shelter was looking for donations where they were trying to um, get dog food and everything donated. And so I jumped in the truck and went to Walmart and bought about 200 pounds of dog food and went to the animal shelter. And it dawned on me, wait a minute, I can take pictures. And so I asked the lady, do you have anybody who does photos of your dogs? And she's, or, you know, all the animals. And she's like, well, we used to have a lady who did it, or she said she was going to do it. And she never came back. And so I'm like, well, I'll do it. (laughs) So about once a week or so, I will go in, weather permitting, uh, because they have an outdoor area for the dogs. And I will photograph all of the cats and dogs that need to be adopted. And um, they've told me that since I started doing that, the uh, adoption rate has gone way up, which Mm -hmm. is the whole goal of this. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I do it for a couple of reasons, not only to give back, 
but it's also I do enjoy doing photography as a hobby. And so this is kind of a way that I can use it for my enjoyment, but also to do some good with it. And I do love animals and I can't adopt them all. So <laughs> I can at least help them find homes. Yeah, that's um, that's fun that when your subjects are puppies and dogs, and cats, because um, mm-hmm. I have a special place in my heart for them as well. Um, and so you recently adopted one, uh, oh, yeah. a, pu- a puppy. So tell us about yeah. that and um, how that's going and why that one, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, years ago, we had two big dogs and we had one little bitty dog. And usually I'm not a little dog person. They're just yappy and annoying to me. Um, but the little dog we had at the time, he was four pounds. He was a Yorkie poo, half teacup poodle, half teacup Yorkie. And he, I think he thought he was a cat because he was just not a typical little dog. But I kind of fell in love with that dynamic of having the two big dogs and the one little dog. And that little dog, Bear Bear, um, I got him the day after my husband deployed the first time. And he was with me, with me through every single deployment. And he was just, he loved being held and being on your lap. And he was just a comforter of sorts. And, you know, over the years, the dogs have passed away. Bear Bear lived to be 16 years old. Um, One of the older dogs died. And then the last remaining big dog actually lives with my daughter in North Carolina. Um, And so I kind of missed having that. We do have two big dogs. And, you know, when you go to the shelter and you see all of these animals who need homes, sometimes they steal your heart. And this little one, I, I brought him out to photograph him and he jumped on my lap. (laughs) And just the way he acted and the sounds that he made and stuff made me think of Bear. And so I came home, cleaned up like I usually do, and I'm like, oh, I got to go get him. (laughs) So I went back and I got him. And he did great. Um, You know, my two my big dogs um, is uh, a Chena is a a husky mix. And um, Duke is a American Staffordshire Terrier Sharpay cattle dog. (laughs) And so I wasn't quite sure how he would do, but him being a big, strong dog Mm -hmm. and Shotzi, the the little one, he gives Duke a run for his money. And I think Chena likes that because those two will go out in the yard and wrestle and they are just all at it. And Chena's like, let (laughs) them. Oh, that's great. Well, we have a small dog and a big dog. So I guess that's, we're missing another big dog is what you're saying. That (laughs) dynamic is really cool. We'll have to see about that. I'll have to uh, break that gently to my husband. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, so let's switch gears a little bit because you spent a good amount of time overseas. And I Mm -hmm. know that, you know, obviously you're homesteading now and you, you believe in um, you know, living naturally and sustainably. How did you do that overseas? Where did you go grocery shopping? Did you seek out a farmer's markets and stuff like that? Tell us a little bit about what that looked like. Well, to be honest, we when we were in Germany, we were very young. And uh, that wasn't really where we were at yet in our life. And we lived in an apartment. Um, so there wasn't really a whole lot you could do in military housing. But over the years, um, you know, we depending on where we were at, sometimes we were in townhomes or apartments or, you know, what have you. Um, But like in Germany, we had this huge uh, balcony. And so my balcony was lined with pots and I was able to grow anything I could in in containers. And, you know, when we did, uh, when we moved to Alaska, I did much of the same. Um, Even though the growing season up there is completely different, uh, you've really got to adapt to doing things up there. Um, but I did what I could. Um, it was difficult. I, I did visit farmers markets and, um, um, things like that. Uh, when we lived in military housing at Fort Bragg, we lived in, um, a duplex townhome kind of place. And my backyard was a jungle. <laughs> it was full of containers of, um, everything you can think of. I even grew corn in pots. And so it was, it was great. And then when we left, um, my next door neighbor had been trying to grow things and he didn't really, couldn't really get the hang of it. So I just kind of gifted it all to him. So that way someone could enjoy what I had, had started. So you learn, you kind of learn to do what you can. It's difficult when you move every couple of years, you know, I mean, we had 19 different homes 
you know, in, in our army life. And so it's hard to do anything um, long term. It, it's just not possible. It is. Yeah, I can relate because my, my father um, retired from the Air Force. So I spent my young life moving from place to place. So I totally mm-hmm. get it. Um, so but tell me a little bit about your blog because that's, mm-hmm. I guess, some of the inspiration came from doing those sorts of things. And so mm-hmm. tell us about, because I know you have a YouTube channel, you have a blog, mm-hmm. um, and you develop recipes. So tell us a little bit about mm-hmm. how that all came about. Well, years ago, like I said before, we had a web TV, and I started a little homepage where I could just share things that um, our family was doing. And, and of course, back then it was just text because we didn't have the, the capabilities that we do now. Um and then 2006, 2005, 2006, I was in a Yahoo group when Yahoo groups were big. And I was in a homemaker's Yahoo group. And we would share recipes, homemaking tips, and things like that. And I found myself sharing the same recipes over and over again and typing out these recipes over and over again. I'm like, I really need some place where I can point people to to find the information that I would like to share. And uh, a friend of mine who had, who she actually ran that Yahoo group, um, told me I should start blogging. And at the time, you know, blogging, well, that was just an online journal. Why would I want my diary on the (laughs) internet for everybody to read? And then she explained to me, she's like, no, 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 you don't have to use it that way. She said, you know, you just type it in and it does the coding for you. And I was like, what? (laughs) I was like, oh my goodness. And so immediately I got online and started my first blog. And it originally it was at Zanga, uh, which I don't even know if that exists anymore. But I, I wasn't on there very long because I didn't like the advertising they had on there. It was kind of yucky. And so I moved shortly thereafter to um, Blogspot. And I blogged there a long time as Mrs. Mama Hen. Uh, don't try to go to that address now because somebody else owns it and it's not a, not a nice website. Um, um. Um, but the reason I started doing it the way I do, um, around the same time, not only did, you know, I, I want a place where I could direct people to, to find my recipes and things like that, but I was teaching a homeschool home ec class and there was a friend of mine who was there one day and she was kind of watching the class and everything. And she says, you know, I really wish they had home ec for grownups because I never learned any of this when I was growing up. And that really got me thinking about the day and age that we live in. Um, Over the years being Army and meeting a lot of people, I've met a lot of wives who couldn't cook dinner for their families. Um, There was one lady in particular, I'll never forget, she told me she couldn't cook hamburger hopper. And and I, I, I was like, well, what do you do when your husband's gone? Oh, we just eat at McDonald's. Oh, so... With people like that in mind, I I started Mrs. Mama Hen, and I try to write in such a way that you don't have to be a trained cook to make meals for your family. And, you know, just over the years, I've gotten wonderful emails and messages from people who, who have used my website to cook for their family and how it's brought them together, and they'll, they'll even make their menus together. And, you know, that's just, that's the reward. Um, I I almost feel like this is almost a ministry to families that I want, I want them to be able to have that family time with one another. And so over the years, it kind of grew from just being recipes to, um, I share a little bit of everything. I've shared our homeschooling adventures back when we were in that stage of life. Um, and now that we are settling down here in Alabama and we're starting homeschooling now it, it, or we're starting homesteading, um, I'm sharing that, um, sharing the things that we do. And a couple of years ago, the same lady who got me blogging, got me into YouTube. Um, and so I got over that fear of doing that. And now I do YouTube and I'm sharing, sharing the ups and downs and my daily life with vlogging. Yeah. Well, tell us, oh, I don't know, two, three recipes on your blog that um, mean something special to you. Because I know like all of your recipes, I guess, that you develop, I know all of mine, and there's sort of a story behind. But what Mm -hmm. are your two or three favorites? Oh, gosh. I mean, there's two that pop out right off the bat. 
um, one of them is uh, it's corn casserole. And that might not sound like corn casserole, but <laughs> I grew up eating that. And so that's, that's not really my own recipe, but every holiday my grandma made corn casserole and you knew it was a holiday from the smell of it. And it, it is just, so I love that recipe in particular, just because of all of the memories tied to that. And then when my family started growing, I make, I do the same thing. I make it every Thanksgiving and every major holiday. I make this corn casserole and the family literally fights over the leftover, leftovers. <laughs> So much so that every holiday I have to make two of them so that there's leftovers. <laughs> and I, a couple times they've said I need to make three, but that's just, that's going too far. <laughs> so that, that one just because of the memories tied to that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one that jumps out to me is I have a Carolina pulled pork recipe. And that one... Again, this is kind of like the memories attached to this recipe. You know, I made it. The family fell in love with it. And um, I came up with that recipe when we lived in Alaska. And I made it for my husband's change of responsibility where he took over as the first sergeant of our unit up there. And normally when they have those, whoever is the incoming first sergeant or what have you, um, they're responsible for the snacks or whatever. And usually it's like cheese and crackers or, you know, whatever. And my husband was like, do you think you could make your pulled pork for that? I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I made it. It was an immediate hit. Um, a few months later, we had a new commander come in. And I hadn't even met the guy yet. Um, they had a, an event, and he came up to me, and he wanted to introduce himself to me. And he says, everybody is asking me if Mrs. Smith is going to make the pulled pork for the change of command. <laughs> and he said, I thought I should ask Mrs. Smith if she should make the pulled pork. <laughs> and so I said, yes, he, he paid for everything and I made it for him. Um, and then it just kind of exploded from there. We had fundraisers where I made like 60 pounds of pulled pork and it was gone in like minutes. I actually have, you can't see it in the picture, but up on the shelf there, I have an engraved wooden bowl. It's kind of the Alaska thing up there. And it actually has my pulled pork named in in this inscription on it. Oh, wow. um, and then down the year or down the down the road, I mean, it's it's been like a staple for some of our major events. I made it for my daughter's wedding. Um, it was the main dish for the wedding. And I made it for my son's wedding. You know, every, it's like everybody wants the pulled pork, so... It's so that, good. That's kind of a... <laughs> I love that. My I famous love the, pulled pork. <laughs> I love the story behind that and how, um, you know, the the memories and the comfort of eating that yeah. and it just sort of uh, strings them together. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, your blog because, you know, we always are preaching to everybody, you know, have more than one stream of income. So do you make mm -hmm. an income from your blog? And have you been doing that, you know, since the beginning? Or did that just sort of evolve? Or tell us a little bit mm -hmm. about that. Um, at the beginning, it didn't. At the beginning, it was just kind of a hobby. Um, I just blogged for, you know, just to do it, just to share my information, just to, you know, put my stuff out there. Um, and then I think... About half the, halfway through the time in Alaska is when I was approached by the first um, business that wanted to work with me. Um, I've uh, since then, I you know, and it started off with free samples where people wanted to send me things for me to share, whatever. And shortly after that, um, I started getting paid to do um, blog post to do um, a sponsored post for this company. And generally it involved um, coming up with a recipe with their product. You know, I've worked with Land Lakes, I've worked with um, Dixie Crystal Sugar, um, a, a bunch of them. I, I can't even think of them all, but, um, and that just kind of grew from there. Um, I had a, ya or a, not a Yahoo group, a Facebook group that I was a part of called Sunday Supper. And that was a great way for us to work together to do campaigns where there would be multiple bloggers working with the company at the same time so that they would get more reach with their campaigns. Um, I've done some with them. I've done some with other companies, whether it's a sponsored post. Um, those are where you make the most money for you know the least amount of work. Um, 
but then at the same time, you can do advertising, uh, sidebar advertising. You can work with advertising campaigns. And that's just your static advertising that's on your website. And so with all of that, I do make pretty decent money. I mean, like my daughter's wedding was kind of thrown at us out of the blue. Hey, mom, we're getting married next <laughs> month. Okay. <laughs> so her entire wedding was paid for with my blog money. So um, it's pretty good. That's great. Well, Scott says he is doing a drive-by as he heads to surgery. So, oh my goodness, Scott, mm. I hope that that all goes well for you. Um, and then Joe is saying she came in late, and where do we find these recipes? And I will put all of the links in the show notes to go to the exact recipes that we were talking about. Um, okay, so let's change gears a little bit again mm -hmm. and talk about yep. homeschooling. Because I yes. homeschool, and you homeschooled. And so, um, this is, I, I love talking to people about this. So, what led you guys to um, homeschool in the first place? Because, you know, uh, as you were saying, you know, you're moving around all the time. And mm -hmm. so, it's, it's, I'm sure what it was for me when I was going through that, hard to, to make friends and keep them and all that. So, why mm -hmm. did you decide, oh, well, I'm just going to, you know, homeschool and what? you speak to that? Well, I, I became a Christian when my kids were little and it was right around the time that my oldest started going to school. And while we were there, this was in Germany. Um, I actually met the first family that I'd ever known who homeschooled. And I was always amazed at how the children behaved themselves, how loving they were to each other. And that's what really opened my eyes to this whole homeschooling thing, because I'd never really heard of it before. And I just, once I got to learning more and more about it, I just really felt like that was what I wanted to do. Now getting my husband on board was a different story. Um, we came back to the States, and the first uh, two years, you know, my husband allowed me to homeschool my daughter. But then when my older son was starting school, my husband's like, oh, no, 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 you can't do two different grades at the same time. And so he made me put them in public school for a while. Um, and then a few years later, um, as the kids got a little bit older, you know, all three were in school. And uh, we were just having a lot of issues with bad schools, bad teachers, um, and I dragged my husband along one day to a parent-teacher conference, and the teacher lied to us, to our faces, and was immediately caught in the lie. And I think that was kind of the eye-opener for my husband. Um, and this was about two weeks before he deployed again. And so the, the way we came about into finally homeschooling um, is kind of a little bit of a story. It's a short one, but he had allowed me to homeschool my daughter because she was the oldest and she was a girl and so he thought it'd be fine to homeschool her but not the boys yet and so that last year with that teacher conference and everything the boys were still in public school and he then my husband deployed and I was fed up one day with with something that had happened with the school and I was like you know what he is not here and I've never even told anybody this. My husband doesn't even know the story, so now he's going to know this. <laughs> um, I had decided I was just going to homeschool the boys because my husband is not here. He's not the one that has to deal with this, and I'm just going to make the command decision, and I'm going to do it because I'm the one that had to deal with everything. And signed the boys up for homeschool football league and everything else and looked out the window one day. The kids were outside playing, so when we lived at the farmhouse. And immediately I was convicted about it and God just kind of was like, excuse me, this is not how we do things around here. And I prayed about it and I was like, you know, Lord, I know I, and I'm not doing this the right way and I've got to fix this. We, I just, I can't bear the thought of putting them back in public school. And 20 minutes later, my husband called me from Iraq and told me to homeschool the boys. Wow. He had no idea. I had even pull the kids out. He had no idea what was going on. And so that was just God. Mm -hmm. And from that point forward, that's all it's been is it's been homeschooling. And, you know, prior to that, my, I had a couple relatives who were not on board with the idea. They didn't understand it. But looking, looking back, I kind of figured out why they were so resistant to the idea. And it's that they were both women 
and they were both pulled out of school at eighth grade. They weren't allowed to finish school because they were girls. And so I, to them, I think they didn't understand what we were doing. But uh, down through the years, you know, every time one of those relatives would come to visit, I would let them see, uh, I would expose them to other homeschoolers. I would take them to football league. I would take them to choir and, you know, the choir my daughter was in and things like that. And so they got a understanding that, wow, Connie isn't really a freak <laughs> who's, who's secluding her children. And so the, I think there was a real appreciation for it. And they, they saw how the kids blossomed and, and grew with that. And plus the flexibility that when a relative came to visit, we could take a couple of days off mm -hmm. and spend that time with them. Whereas if the kids were in public school, that wouldn't even be a possibility. And so, you know, we, we didn't have a strict schedule. We started in the middle of summer when the weather was too hot to be outside anyways. Mm -hmm. And then we would take off the entire month of October and enjoy the beautiful weather, have time with family and things like that. It would just, I really saw that my kids did very, very well that way. Um, I could see the difference in them, their personalities. And it was just, I knew it was the right thing for our family. Not to mention that with military lifestyle and moving constantly, I didn't have to worry about changing schools. I didn't have to worry about different curricula or anything like that because we would just pause, we would move, and then we would pick up where we left off. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that's great. That's beautiful. I love that story. So let me ask you this. When you're moving around, did you have any problem with um, the different laws in different states? Because isn't it illegal now to homeschool in Germany? So can you talk about that a little bit? Okay, so we homeschooled, we only homeschooled in three states because just as we were at Fort Bragg for a very long time, we just moved a lot while we were there. Um, so North Carolina has pretty easy um, laws. You, you pretty much just register with state, have your kids tested once a year. It, it, it's pretty hands off. Um, Alaska is completely hands off. You know, you don't even have to register with Alaska. Um, the only the only involvement that the state or the school system or anything would have with you is if you enrolled your child in one of the homeschool programs that they have. And my older son did do that. Um, so he was on the he took a woodworking class through the high school, and he was on the sharpshooting team at the high school, competed in the junior Olympics and everything like that. And so that was good for him. Um, so Alaska is easy. I mean, they don't have. It's such a huge state, and there's so many people that live in the middle of nowhere. How could the, the state ever possibly regulate anything with that? Um, and then down here in Alabama, it again is pretty. It's pretty easy. You just you have to register through a school, so it's kind of like your umbrella or whatever. But the one, the particular umbrella that we use was very hands off, very freedom minded, very keep the government out of your business, let the parents be the parents, and so I appreciated that. Um, as far as Germany goes, you know, we didn't homeschool when we were there, but, you know, we did know homeschoolers there. Uh, the way it works for military families who are stationed over there is they don't fall under the German laws. And that is a huge, huge thing because, um, like, when a military family is stationed over there, they go to uh, DOD schools, Department of Defense schools. So they fall under the DOD. They don't fall under the German school system. And so American children have a little bit of a reprieve from that. Um, I don't think anything has changed as far as that goes because I still know people who are over there in homeschool. Um, but, yeah, it... I know it, it concerns people sometimes when they go over there if they're homeschooling, but thankfully they don't fall under the German law because that would just be awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is good, and that's good to know because I, I didn't know how that worked, and so that's mm -hmm. great. But you're still, your, your children are grown right now because mm -hmm. um, you're done with homeschooling per se, but you're still sort of teaching with yeah. your blogging and your writing, so could you tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about that? Um, well, I, I teach, you know, through my blog, I teach, you know, cooking and, and things like that, recipes that are easy to follow and easy to understand. I do a lot of step-by-step -step photos so that people who are visual can see. Um, but then I also do workshops. You know, I teach people how to blog, not necessarily to do what I'm doing, but just to blog in general. I've uh, spoken at workshops 
Um, just last week, I spoke at a writer's conference about blogging and about using social media and um, doing what you love and finding a way to make profit with that. Um, so I do things like that. Um, i trying to think what else. I, I, I've done one-on-one. -on -one, um, um, I guess you could call it almost like tutoring where someone was starting a foundation and needed to start a website. And so I did one-on-one -on -one, um, counseling with them and, and walked them through the stages of how to run their website, how to set it up, and things like that. So there's there's kind of like a little bit. I kind of do a little, little bit of everything. <laughs> it sounds what like I have the time. <laughs> it. It just sounds like you have a teaching personality. I, I do. love that. And then you just you know want to give, and that's mm -hmm. just it's that's it's one of my favorite types of people. So um, you're our, my you're my kind of person. I think I put that in the description. <laughs> Um, when I put this on Facebook. Um, hello, Tracy. There's two Tracys, and hello, Misty. So saying hello to everybody who's coming in. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, Second Amendment rights. Can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about um, your background with firearms? Oh, goodness. Well, I didn't really grow up with them. You know, I grew up in the town. I, I never really had anything to do, I think my first experience was with firearms was my senior year in high school. In the, the town I grew up in, the high school, PE wasn't a required class for your senior year, but there was an alternative class you could take, it was called Outdoor Adventure, where we did kayaking and skiing and rappelling and all different stuff. And one of the, one of the courses that we actually did was firearm safety. And the high school that I went to actually had a range in the basement and it was, it was for the ROTC but the outdoor adventure class used that. And so that was my first actual experience with firearms. Um, and then down the road, I, we didn't really hunt or anything when we were younger just because we moved so much and apartment living and all that stuff um, and raising babies, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but then I want to say probably around the time we moved to North Carolina is when I started really um, taking an interest and in really um, learning more about it. And over the time that we lived there, I, I got more interested in hunting and things like that. And then when my kids, um, when, I, when I started homeschooling all of them, um, I met a homeschool family that lived out where we did in the same area. And her kids were part of a homeschool 4-H uh, club that was sharpshooting. And so I'm like, oh, this sounds interesting. So I immediately signed my kids up because I wanted them to learn how to use a firearm because we did have country living in mind. And when you live in the country, I feel like being knowledgeable about firearms to protect not only yourself, your family, but your livestock and everything else, I think that's very important for people to know, not only as a, a rural liver, but honestly as an American, but that's a whole different ball game. <laughs> Um, I, I agree. But so I, I did, I signed the kids up for that. And, you know, the first time we went, my sons were all over it. They were very excited. But my daughter didn't want to do it. She, she didn't want to do it. Her friend was there, so she went with her friend. But um, I said, okay, well, someday you say you want to live in Montana and you want to have a horse ranch and all this stuff. I said, so are you going to sit there and just watch a mountain lion eat your horse or are you going to do something about it? Mm -hmm. And she looked at me. And she turned around and she went straight to the rifle range and, and learned. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so she, and then later on, I actually did become a certified instructor. I, I was the shotgun instructor for the 4-H club. Wow, that's great. I love that story about your daughter. Okay, so you have an Etsy shop and you sell aprons. Do you make those aprons? Yes, I do, wow. I do. Um, years ago, I made myself a very simple apron. It, it kind of wraps around and covers you on all sides, you know, so that your your clothing is protected. And I have found it to be a very uh, useful, it's a very utilitarian apron. And I started wearing it a lot when we moved out here and I was working on the chicken coop and things like that. And, you know, keeping my, cl my clothes clean and everything. And I had several of my subscribers comment on it that they would like an apron like that because I guess they hadn't seen one anywhere. And so I'm like, oh, okay, well, maybe I'll start making some. And so I did. When, when I have the time, I, I squeeze in a little bit of sewing 
and I do make um, aprons. I call them farm girl work aprons, uh, just because they're they're hard workers. And um, I make most of them out of duck cloth, which I find to be a little bit more durable, especially if you're using them in the garden or things like that. But of course, they're good in the kitchen too. Yeah. Um, I make the pockets nice and big, so you can actually put stuff in them. Um, I have I like putting a pocket on the chest so I can stick my cell phone right there, so I can hear if it rings or whatever. <laughs> Um, and keep it from getting splashed and whatever. Um, and then I, I've had uh, people ask for linen ones, so I did start making a couple out of linen. And then I do on occasion make some out of ordinary um, print, like calico, muslin type, a lighter, lighter fabric too. So yeah. I think there's only maybe four of them in the shop right now, but I've got about 10 more aprons worth of fabric to work on. So <laughs> hopefully I can get some made pretty soon and added. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, it's just so wonderful to have you here on the show. I love uh, talking about all this stuff. It's just been a joy to talk to you. Where can people find out more about you, uh, your Facebook, your website? Can mm -hmm. you just tell us um, where to go to get more stuff mm -hmm. about everything we've been talking about? Sure. Um, on Facebook, and my, well, my website is cosmopolitancornbread.com. You can also type in cosmocornbread.com because it's a little easier. They'll both take you to my website. Um, on Facebook, I'm Cosmopolitan Cornbread. On Twitter, it's Cosmo Cornbread. Um, on Snapchat, it's Cosmo Cornbread. And then on YouTube, it's Cosmopol Cosmopolitan Cornbread's Homestead. And I just felt like that kind of gave it a little more of the flavor of what I'm doing on my YouTube channel. Yeah. So I'm kind of everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and you're brave enough to do the Snapchat thing. So I, I have on a occasion. lot of admiration <laughs> for you. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's a lot of fun. Okay, guys. So we have been talking um, to Constance Smith from Cosmopolitan Cornbread. I want to thank her so much for being here. If you came in late, I just want to make sure that you know that you can go to the show notes and get all of the information that we talked about here today and all of those yummy recipes. Um, really quick, before we go, I just want to let you guys know that uh, Self-Reliant School is growing and that is a really, really good thing. We're really excited about it. Um, but the thing is, you know, when a business grows, then the bills grow and all of that. And so we are finding ourselves at a place where we need to raise our prices. And so um, the thing is that they're going to go up on April 1st. But I wanted to let you guys know about that so you can get in on the price that it is currently. Um, and you can go to selfrelianceschool.com slash membership. Yeah, that's the right um, URL bill yes. membership and you can get in on the price that we have currently and then we don't ever raise the prices for current members so as long as you are in current standing um, your membership is in current standing then you will pay that price um, as long as you are a current member so just a note there if you've been thinking about joining now would be the time because as of April 1st the price will go up and that is no joke okay so remember that being self-reliant is not about being selfish and not just about you. It's about taking care of yourself so that you can take care of the ones that you love. Take care until we talk again. I'm so glad you could join me today. Here's what to do next. Head over to selfrelientlife.tv to pick up the show notes for this episode and to watch replays of older episodes. To go directly to the show notes for this episode, go to selfrelientlife.tv and then without a space, type a slash and then the number of today's episode. You can watch this show live every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, live on Facebook or the Periscope app. Don't forget to stop by selfrelientschool.com slash free to get your free Self Reliant School videos that will help you get started living a self-reliant life. Also, if you're listening to this show as a podcast and you've liked what you've heard today, please subscribe through Stitcher, iTunes, or your favorite podcast app. If you're on a mobile device, just search for The Self-Reliant Living Show. If you're on a laptop or desktop, just go to selfrelientlife.tv slash iTunes. And while you're there, please leave a review. 
I love to hear from you. You leaving feedback makes it easier for others that are interested in living a self-reliant life to find my podcast. Take care until we talk again.